Over four years ago, I went to work at a warehouse in a small town as a quality control technician. I decided to leave after my health started to get worse physically, and I was diagnosed with panic disorder and severe anxiety after the situation that I'm about to tell you. This changed the way that I developed friendships after that job, that's for certain. So, I started this job on April Fool's Day of 2019, and I had no kind of high expectation of the job. All I wanted was to do my job, get paid, and go home, as I had two children at home and many things that I could work on there. The job wasn't hard, and it made pretty good money for all duties considered, so I really couldn't complain. I worked second shift for about five months, and I went to day shift. While working on second shift, I kept to myself mostly until, one day, I met someone from one of the lines after we struck up a conversation about gaming. He introduced himself as Jay. Well, Jay was a pretty good guy and we had a lot of things in common. I went home that night and he popped up as a suggested friend on Facebook, so I decided to add him. When I did, we started talking more at work, until he suggested we should hang out. So, we did hang out, pretty frequently. We were friends for a month at this point, and one day, he decided that he was going to introduce me to his partner. She seemed decent at first, really nice, didn't seem to be a judgmental type, so I was cool with her. From then on, I would hang out with him when my kids were spending time with my mother. One time, we were talking at a restaurant, and he started to vent to me. Dude, she's such a bitch sometimes. The other day, I forgot to take out the trash, and she threatened to stab me if I didn't. I've never been in a relationship where someone's threatened me, but she's got good intentions, dude. When he said that to me, I was concerned. But of course, we'd only been friends for a month, so I thought that maybe he was being morbid jokingly, so I chuckled at him. He gave me a pretty serious look and said, I'm not joking, she really did. That concerned me. Fast forward about eight months, they're still together and we all hang out pretty regularly, forgetting the things he told me then. One day we were all talking and he seemed a little off that day, so I asked him what was wrong in front of her. He flashed a smirk and said, Nothing dude, I'm just a little tired. He didn't have his eyes on me though, he had them on her when I asked that. When we went to work the next day, I asked him again, Do you promise to keep this between us? Of course, I agreed. He said that he was breaking up with her and she went a little crazy. He said that he grabbed her firearm and pointed it at him and said, If I can't have you, then no one will. He said that he defused the situation and he's trying to look for a way out. Not really knowing what to say, I just said, You'll figure it out, man. If you need somewhere to go, then you can come stay with me until you get her out of the house. Fast forward to another year. He finally decided to leave her. When he did, she flipped out again. This time, he told her over text. She said that she was going to find him and kill him, and he was actually out of work that day with a vacation day. He sent me a text that said, Hey, let me know if she comes over to work looking for me. That struck me as odd because I had no idea of the situation that was unfolding. She actually did come to our job and she asked me where he was and I said, I have no idea. I thought he was with you and you guys went out of town or something. All she did was roll up her window and drive off. I called him and told him that she came by and he called the police about it. They had found her up the road with a loaded gun in the car. Two months later, he decided to talk to her again, and when he did, he had something to tell me. When he called me, he asked if I had seen her around, and I hadn't. He said, I would take some vacation days if I were you. Dumbfounded, I asked him why. He said to me, because she's out of jail and her cousins are in town, trying to find the people she has personal vendettas with. You are one of them. At that point, I was terrified. I grabbed my kids and went out of town, and I took two weeks off of work. Come to find out that the next day, 
Her and her cousins went to the next town over and shot three people in an apartment and killed them. I got the news about it the day after it happened. The reason why he knew they were coming after me is because they made a Facebook messenger group that he was included in and sent a list of names. Everyone regarded it as spam and decided to disregard the message, but he knew what it was. Three of those names on that list were the people they shot. The fourth name on that list was mine. After they found the evidence and he decided to go public about the group and screenshots that he had, they were all charged with first degree murder. From then on, I was very careful about who I would stick my neck out for, because even though he knew the context of that list and her intentions, he decided to not inform anyone else on it. Needless to say, we aren't friends anymore, and I dodged a bullet, literally. In 2017, I heard news of people dressing up as clowns and running around with knives at night. I typically brush those things off because I've got my own problems. I was often up all hours of the night dealing with my screaming newborn. It was January or February, so we still had some snow and I wasn't able to get out of the house often. Taking out the trash, which is located right out the back door, was usually the most I got of fresh air. One morning, I took out the trash and happened to glance over to the right and noticed footprints directly under the window to my newborn baby's room. I walked over to inspect, and not only were there footprints, but there were also hand indentations on the window screen. Weird, but my baby slept in my room, so I'm not very concerned at the moment. But my boyfriend was losing his marbles. Fast forward a couple of days, and I was up at around 3 a.m., and I heard what I would not exactly call screaming, but more of a screeching howl. We have a lot of stray cats, so I kind of thought that's what it was and ignored it. Once the sun was up, I looked out the window and noticed a few set of footprints that really didn't make sense, because it kind of looked like someone had just been passing in between the house. But again, I blow it off because we had a drug house across the street and we have had people crossing through our yard before they get to that house. Maybe four nights later, again at 3am, I'm breastfeeding and hear a dragging noise against the house, and from where I was sitting on the couch, I could see the back door. The back door has a window with blinds on it, and doesn't seal well due to wood rot on the frame. I pause the TV and listen just to hear it again, now directly at the back door. Looking over, I can clearly see a looming figure just standing in the window. I could see the outline of one of those big kitchen knives, and granted the blinds were shut, so I am seeing the creepy shadow version of this. He runs the knife across the window pane before softly knocking. Meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out what to do with a newborn latched on, because my phone is in the bedroom and something in me doesn't want whoever this is out of my vision. So I stand up and readjust, because I really don't want a screaming baby right then. I walk into my kitchen and flick on the light, and then said, just loud enough for him to hear me, Hey man, I already called the police, and I'm sure you don't want to deal with them, so why don't you go home? I don't know why I talked to him so calmly and normal, but I don't think he was expecting anyone to say anything, because he froze the moment I began talking. He talked it over with himself for a minute and darted toward the alleyway. I've never had anything like that happen since, but my boyfriend sure was mad I didn't wake him up to handle the situation, or at least call the police. I'm not sure if this counts as a creepy encounter, but I was sure creeped out once my sleep-deprived self realized what happened. When I was seven years old, my mother and father got a divorce. This event prompted her to move and follow her career in a different small town, which would pay better, as she was a single parent now. On our long 12-hour drive to the new location, 
We stopped on the way in this little town which was very hippie. Sort of had lots of art, little shops and whatnot. My mom said we were there to meet up with her friend, Paulette. I guess they went way back in her college days and recently got in touch after a decade. We end up going to this East Indian restaurant where we would meet for dinner. This slender, somewhat fragile woman walks in. She was very tall, well over six feet. Big, frizzy, curly brown hair with blonde streaks in it. She was Caucasian, wearing a colorful shawl with feather earrings, with very pale blue eyes. She looked like a mosaic tapestry or something. She walks over to the table and gives my mom a greeting and a big hug, makes her way over to my older brother and shakes his hand. After, she comes around to my side of the table. I lend my hand out to her, and she just stood there expressionless, with her mouth partly open with a blank gaze, just staring at me. It briefly made me uncomfortable, and then like a flick of a switch, this spark ignites in her face. She makes this huge Cheshire cat smile, kneels over and hugs me tightly. She goes back to sit with my mom and they catch up over the years while we eat dinner. My mom gets the bill and says to her in the parking lot, You can just follow us, to Paulette. We get in the car and my mom explains to us, Paulette is actually coming over to live with us for a while. She followed us for the next several hours. We get to the new place and unpack our necessity items, as we had a moving truck hired with the rest of our stuff arriving in the morning. There was a bunk bed already set up at this place for me and my brother. It was fairly late into the night, roughly 11pm when we arrived. Me and my brother set up our sleeping bags. I take the top bunk. My mom says goodnight. I fell asleep pretty quickly. I wake up at around 1.30am. I guess the patio deck light got turned on, which was right beside our room. I gazed out through the blinders, and I see the back of Paulette's curly hair. She was sitting on the deck, cross-legged, smoking a cigarette. I didn't think much of it, and I lay back down, until I noticed the light from the window gets partly blocked out. I look behind me with my head still on the pillow. I see the unmistakable outline of Paulette's shadow facing my window. She was there for a few minutes. I didn't want to lean up, I just pretended to sleep. Her shadow moves and I hear the front door close. The patio light turns off after a few seconds. I reposition myself facing the wall to go back to sleep. As I begin to drift off, the door to our room opens slowly and I quickly turned my head around. It wasn't my mom, it's Paulette wearing a nightgown. I turn back facing the wall and close my eyes. She quietly makes her way to my bunk. I feel her fingers in a claw formation start to comb the back of my hair, running her nails onto the back of my scalp. I kept my eyes closed tightly, nearly holding my breath, trying to give no signs I'm awake. I smell some essential oils like lavender, and she starts rubbing oil into the back of my neck and pinching the back of my neck muscle, sometimes holding it and releasing it. I begin to kind of just accept whatever is happening, because it didn't feel all that bad after a while. I actually ended up falling asleep to it after my initial confusion. I wake up in the morning, my mom is off at work, and Paulette is waiting at the table with cereal for me and my brother. She put some chocolate chips in my bowl and not my brother's. My brother and I make small talk with her. She was very giggly, seemed to be trying to make us comfortable with the new situation. My brother heads back to his room to set up his GameCube after his cereal. I was a slower eater than my older brother, so I was always the last at the table. As I slowly ate, she was sitting there watching my every move. Once I finished, I said thank you and grabbed my bowl to bring it to the sink. She places her hand on mine and says, I gave you a neck massage so you wouldn't pee your bed. I know lots of young ones pee beds when they sleep in unfamiliar surroundings. I looked up at her and said, I've never peed my bed before, but thank you. She continued to massage the back of my neck for the next few nights. I ended up telling her I'm comfortable here now and I don't need her to do that anymore. 
She reacted to that with a sigh, but acknowledged it. I started elementary school the following week, which meant getting earlier night's sleep at around 8pm. Her and my mom would stay up much later than me and my brother and drink wine. I always waited for them to go to bed before I used the washroom at night to go pee, because my mom would kind of scold me for being up late on weeknights. Once things got quiet at around 11 in the house, I'd sneak out and tiptoe to go use the washroom. This was my ritual for the next few weeks, until Paulette started doing the exact same thing at the same time. Every time. Every night when I needed the washroom, it just so happened Paulette needed it too, and she would blaze down the hallway across from my room when I'd open the door. I'd just go back in my room and wait for her. It started happening so frequently I would just go outside to pee from the back mudroom door. This started to piss me off, no pun intended. I'd open my door as quietly as I could and then sprint to the washroom. This seemed effective for a while. One night, I'd get up slightly later than usual at around 12. I was a little more careless with noise because I was half asleep and groggy. I open the door and Paulette's door just slams open instantly. She barges out into the dimly moonlit hallway completely naked and just start quickly walking down the hallway. I was already so far down the hallway, I couldn't turn back to my room. I jump behind my mom's jade plant and squish my knees to my chest and tuck my head down. She whizzes straight by me so fast, I felt wind push my hair. She stays in the washroom for almost an hour with the door open to crack, lights off in silence. I stayed there beside the washroom, tucked in the corner behind the plant pot, not making a sound. I hear the washroom door open completely, and she starts pacing up and down the hallway. I kept small and insignificant behind the plant until she goes back to her room. I brushed this off as a complete accident. It was just unfortunate timing. But no, every night going forward, she would literally sprint down the hallway naked if I'd make a single noise, creak the floorboard, open my door or whatever. About two months into this, me and my brother were sword fighting with tree branches outside. He ends up clipping my forehead, causing it to bleed pretty bad. Paulette sees this happen. She walks up to my brother, what I thought would be to scold him, but no. She stomp kicks him in the head with her boot, causing him to fall on his back. He gets up off the ground crying and runs into the house. She grabs me and starts cradling me, rocking back and forth. She's shaking so much that she was vibrating. She kept repeatedly asking me, are you hurt? In a shaky voice. Anyway, my mom finds out through my brother what happened and decides she had to leave. Her final day, she made a point to see me one-on-one -on -one in the driveway before entering her car. She knelt down and said, I hope I see you in a different life. You remind me so much of my husband. Goodbye. And she starts bawling her eyes out, hugging me. I asked my mom who her husband was. I guess he was a marine that died in Afghanistan a few months prior to her moving in with us. My mom said she would frequently say how much I reminded her of him on a daily basis. My mom hasn't spoken to her since. I've never told my mom about the massages or anything to this day, as she was already exiled and I felt it would just cause more drama. Hello everyone, something really creepy happened to me yesterday. I'm still processing it because what the fuck? For a bit of context, I live in Ireland, a pretty peaceful country. I recently moved from Galway to Dublin. I moved up north to Dublin which is a rougher part but it's still not too bad. I live with my family outside the city. The area is pretty rural. It's just houses and farms pretty much, with no shops or stations nearby. There are no sidewalks, and the road is pretty narrow and worn out. It's rare to see cars, so it's fine to just go on the road. I was going on my daily 2k run. Usually I go around at 6pm, 
but yesterday I had some studying to do and went out at around 9pm. Let me describe the experience. Imagine to your left there's a house that's lived in with its lights on. Then on your right you see a field slash farm. Then you'll see an abandoned building right beside. And then there's an area of trees for 200 meters or so. This is pretty much the whole road. Not abandoned, but creepy enough to scare me at night. Anyways, I usually listen to music on my run with the volume all the way up so I can't hear anything. So I reach the area with a patch of trees. It's basically pitch black, the lights don't work properly, so I need to use a flashlight to navigate. The street lights are flickering on and off, but they eventually stay on, so that's great. But that's when it hits me. There's a figure standing around 30 meters away, about 20 meters from the road in the trees. First, I thought I was seeing stuff, but no. This person was standing still, not moving at all. I'm creeped out, so I keep running. I turn down the volume of the music just in case to hear the figure move so I can make a run for it. I speed up and pass the figure. I still don't turn up my music. After I'm around 100 meters away, I turn up the music and try to process what happened. Maybe I was seeing things because it was pretty dark. At this point, I'm long gone. However, I still have to come back home, and I usually walk back the distance I ran, so it's basically I run 2k and walk back 2k. Again, I come to that spot. This time, the lights are flickering, but they're mostly staying on. I try to observe the spot where the figure was standing, but I see nothing. I'm creeped out at this point. I turn off the music and start to run past that spot because I'm scared, and then suddenly a man jumps across the street in front of me. It looks like the same figure. I come to a halt for a second, I'm shocked. He then starts moving, so I turn around and start running as fast as I can. While I'm doing this, I start screaming for help. I eventually passed the tree area and went to an area with houses. Someone heard me screaming and came out asking me if everything was okay. I stop running and realize the guy is gone. I explain everything to the man. I'm really creeped out and scared. I still need to go back home, but my parents aren't there. They went over to their friend's house, so I'm left home alone. I ask the stranger for a lift, because I'm not going back there ever again. Thankfully, the stranger isn't a big old creep and he kindly escorts me home. I lock all the doors and check everything to make sure I'm safe. Shortly after, my parents arrive, but I don't tell them anything because I don't want to worry them. I haven't gone out for a run today because I'm genuinely scared. I'm terrified thinking about what would have happened if I was too tired to run and he caught me. I don't think anything else will happen though, hopefully. This happened about 30 years ago in a small town about 10 minutes outside of Atlantic City. I was about 25 at the time, and my mom was in her mid-50s. It was a week or so before Christmas, and my mom asked if I wanted to go with her to a small shop so she could pick up a few things. I agreed, and even offered to drive. We pulled into the parking lot and parked facing a stockade fence, the kind that were all in the range of 80s to 90s. This lot was bordered by the small, barely two-lane street on the side we entered on, and a four-lane highway on the other side. The lot served as a Chinese restaurant, a deli, a pizzeria, the shop we were stopping in, and a few other businesses. It was around 6pm, so only the pizzeria, the restaurant, and the shop were open, so there were very few cars. The first three spots on either end were handicapped spaces, so I parked further down in one of about eight spots between the handicap spots. We get out of the car and had only gone a few steps toward the street when a man I would guess was in his late 30s to early 40s walked out from between a couple of cars. My spider sense went into full alert immediately. He took a couple steps towards us, looked right at us and said, I fucking hate people like you, in a low menacing voice. 
I instinctively took a step to my side to place myself between him and my mom. Like what? I said. People that park in handicapped spots, he said, nodding behind me. I'd grown up in this town. I rode my bike here all the time as a kid and was here quite often as an adult. I knew for sure that I wasn't in one of those spots. I had even parked a few spaces further in since neither me or my mom had mobility issues. I'm not in a handicapped spot, I said confidently. This time the man pointed over my shoulder, grew agitated and said, Yes you are. Look. It was then that I realized that he knew we weren't parked in a handicapped spot, but he was trying to get me to turn around. I don't know what his intentions were. I'm a pretty big guy at 6 foot 1 and 200 plus pounds. I'm not sure if he had a weapon or just wanted to distract me so he could get the jump, maybe snatch my mom's purse. Either way, I decided that rather than confront him directly, I would play a little game back. I drove a Chrysler, and back then, the keys were topped with a black plastic pentagon with the Dodge logo stamped into it. I curled my fist around the plastic head of the key, with the metal parts sticking out a couple of inches between my pointer and middle fingers, so that if I were to be punched in the eye, well, they wouldn't have an eye after that. I held my hand up and pointed over my shoulder with the metal part of the key and said, There's no sign on that spot. His eyes flashed from behind me to the key protruding from between my fingers, back to my eyes. I flashed my eyes to the key, lowered my hand slightly, then met his gaze. My mom is behind me, saying something I don't recall. This game of chicken between me and this guy goes on for about three to four seconds, before he says, whatever, fuck you, and walks away towards the highway at the opposite end of the parking lot. I watch him leave before turning around. Sure enough, there were at least three spots between my car and any handicapped spot. He was 100% trying to distract me. He was so matter-of-fact that as we walked towards the store, my mom was wondering what he was going on about. I told her that he was trying to get me or us to turn around. The second time, when he had pointed, my mom said she turned around, even though she knew we weren't parked in a handicapped spot. I'm glad I trusted my instincts. It's not the first time my spider sense was right, but that's a story for another day. This happened to me about five to six years ago. I went out for dinner with a friend. I'd left my car at a condo since we carpooled. When we returned to the condo, we parted ways. She went into her unit by elevator, and I walked to my car parked outside. It was around 11pm and there were lots of lights around, but I still took precaution considering that this wasn't the best part of town. No one else was outside, no cars leaving or coming in. I got into my car and proceeded to drive on my merry way home as normal. I pulled up to a red light and a white SUV pulled up beside me. I absentmindedly looked around and then looked to my right and made eye contact with the driver. I'm not sure how long he was staring for, but it was creepy. I suddenly got a cold sweat feeling. I proceeded to drive down the long street and his car was always beside mine. I noticed he was watching my speed and trying to look over at me. I ignored it. This went on for 15 minutes down the same street. My house was another 15 minutes away. There were other cars, but they mostly turned into the smaller streets. I was nervous the whole time, so I texted my friend and my boyfriend to let them know what was happening, but that I was fine for now, and maybe I was misinterpreting this. At one point, the street became one lane because the cars parked on the right side overnight so the SUV ended up behind me the whole way. I finally made a turn to another main street where there was more traffic. Somehow he kept up and was pretty much tailing me. I called my boyfriend freaking out and almost crying at this point. 
He told me to stay calm and to try and turn around onto another major street, not to a small one in case anything happened. We hit an area with construction workers working on the road, so two lanes were closing. I was in the far left lane. He pulled up to the pylons to my right and rolled down his window. I'm pretty sure he was shouting to me at this point. His lips were moving, but I don't know what he said. He pointed at me to roll down my window. He looked angry and a little deranged. I sped off as soon as the light changed, but he was stuck in that lane because no one was letting him through. I was able to get home safely and my boyfriend met up with me in the garage. I was shaken, but thankfully it never happened again. When I told this story to my friends, there was a question of, what if there was something wrong with your car and he just wanted to tell you? But no, there wasn't. There was no flat tire or open door. The gas cap was intact. To this day, I have no idea what he wanted. And I don't think I want to know. Coming back from Kununurra, a very northern town in Western Australia, to Perth one night, there was no one else on the road for hours, but every now and then, on a long straight, I could see a set of taillights in the distance. All of a sudden, there's the taillights, attached to a trailer that stopped dead in the middle of the road. I slammed on the brakes and swerved around it, and that's when I realized that the truck, towing three cars, had run off the road into the only large tree for miles. If not for how this ended, I'd laugh my ass off at the irony. I pulled forward off the road and jumped out. My co-driver, who'd been asleep but got thrown out of the bunk when I slammed on the brakes, was already calling emergency services. As I got to the back of my third trailer, wisps of smoke started from under the cab of the Volvo wrapped around the tree. I raced back grabbed a fire extinguisher and was running towards the wreck when I heard a groan from the ditch about 10 meters in front of the wreck. The driver had been thrown clean through the windscreen and while he was an absolute mess, at least he was alive. The Volvo was, by now, in flames but that just gave me some light to inspect the guy for injuries and then I heard the sound that even now tears me to the core. A thin, high-pitched squeal, gradually progressing into the most soul-piercing scream I've ever heard. His co-driver had also been asleep in the bunk, and with the truck wrapped around the tree, he was stuck, and I hadn't thought to fight the fire. And now some poor bastard was burning to death, trapped in a steel coffin while I just collapsed, impotent and broken. I still drive trucks now, it's my life. It's cost me several relationships and a marriage, but I don't know anything else that I can do. I love the life, I love the freedom, and I always know that I can lose everything in the blink of an eye. But I never again, and never will, drive as a two-up team. I could never live with killing a workmate because I fucked up. For the weekend, I wanted to visit my boyfriend. He lives two hours away and I go by train. I'm not easily spooked, but I always keep an eye out. One hour into the trip, it was around 8 in the evening then, I see two men getting into the same train compartment as me. I was sitting in a two-seat. The seat next to me was empty, and in front of me there was a seat for four people, so two pairs of seats facing each other. The men came in being very loud, but nobody said anything because they already seemed very suspicious. From the moment they stepped into the train, probably before they got in, they had their eyes fixated on me. They stepped in through the doors and sat in the seat in front of mine, and from then on they kept an eye on me, while discussing things with each other in a language I didn't understand. 
Like every other girl, I get stared at frequently, especially when I wear my hair down. It normally makes me feel a bit awkward, but I never feel unsafe when this happens. Until yesterday. But they were staring at me in every possible way. Through the chairs, standing up, sitting down, and bending over to get a good look. Through the reflection of the mirror, and by getting up and walking past me, they were taking turns and walking over to the other compartment of the train. The other compartment was only separated from mine with a glass door. Every time one of them got up, they both started staring at me. Then one of them went away, and the other one had a clear vision of me and kept staring at me. He poked his head through the middle of the seats and offered me a chocolate, which I politely refused. Then the other one came back and five minutes later, the man who did not go away yet went away in the same direction. They kept taking turns and walking away, and every time one of them got up, the other who remained seated kept an eye on the other, and on me. Each time they were sitting across from each other, they discussed things, but I could not translate it. They kept looking at me, and then started discussing again. When I had 20 minutes of my trip left, a lot of people got out at one stop. It was just me, them, and one other male left. The moment the doors were about to close, one of the creepy men started walking through the doors to check if there were people coming in, and maybe to check if there was security. I don't know why he did it, but when he came back, he scanned the train to see how many people were still on there. From that moment on, they both got in seats facing me. They would not stop staring at this point. As you can imagine, I panicked and was stressed the fuck out. So, I slowly turned around to look behind the glass doors to see if there were any more people there. I slowly and very softly put on my jacket, and I kid you not, not even two minutes later, one of the men starts getting dressed too. He took his bag and his jacket and kept looking at me. He was fixated on me while still discussing with the other man. This was where I really panicked. I already let my friends know what was going on, and my boyfriend was already at the train stop where I was supposed to get out. Then I contemplated what the smartest thing to do was, because there is an emergency number on the train that you can call or text if you feel unsafe. But I had a gut feeling that this wouldn't help me. So I got my bags got up, and walked through the glass doors to the other compartment. I sat facing them so I could see what they were doing. They both got up, grabbed their bags, and started walking towards me. Mind you, they were sitting closest to the exit, so there was absolutely no reason for them to take this route too. I rapidly started to talk to someone on the seats next from mine, and asked if he could help me because I was getting followed and watched by two grown men. He said he also thought they were very suspicious and was getting scared for me. He asked me to sit next to him so he could help keep me a little safer and distract the men or something. Then he distracted me a bit and asked questions about my life. When the two creeps saw I got seated next to a man, they were already coming my way and were making their way through the doors of the compartment. Their glass doors so we could see each other very clearly. I'd not shown my fear, but I was shaking so uncomfortably that they must have seen how scared I was. The moment they got through that door, they saw me getting seated next to the man, and the creeps exchanged looks, looked at me, discussed something, looked at me again, turned around and went the other way again. They were walking to the exit of the train, where, again, there is a glass door, so we could still see each other. The whole time they were standing around the exit, they were looking at me with a very creepy and disturbed look on their faces. I describe it as, you got away, but you won't be lucky next time. That's how I felt. The man I was sitting next to also got the hang of this and was calming me down. He told me he was not going to let me get off the train by myself and would wait with me until my boyfriend would arrive. But then came our stop, 
and we walked to our side of the exit. And then came a realization. In the exit of the train, there were two other men standing there with the same kind of look as the two creeps. They talked the same language and they acted weird too. These men were probably the men the two creeps visited every few minutes. The man at the exit saw me, looked at me with a creepy look, but then the man who kept me safe made sure to let them know that he was walking with me, and they immediately looked away. They also covered their faces with hoods. The doors opened and they nearly sprinted out of there, just as the other two creeps did. The man who escorted me out waited with me until we found my boyfriend, and then he went on with his day. We both could not thank him enough for keeping me safe. I thought I lived in a very safe country in Europe, but I think that as long as you're a young woman or on your own, you will never be 100% safe while traveling or being alone. I hate thinking about what would have happened if I was not helped out by that man. I wish I could have thanked him with gifts or a nice gesture, but I never got his name and will probably never see him again. To the man who saved me, I thank you with all my heart. I hope people hearing this, as well as myself, stay safe. Just be on the lookout for each other and help someone when you can. Thanks for listening. This story takes place last summer in August, when I went to visit my friend in another city. I'd been there for one day and this night we decided to go out for some drinks and then for dinner. While we were walking to the restaurant, dressed to the nines, a couple of men older than us stopped us and asked what we were doing that night. We chatted and then asked if we would be willing to come for a drink with them after. My friend and I, being young, and liking the attention of course, said we would see how we feel, and they said that they would be staying at the restaurant that we saw them outside of, and that their usual table was right next to the patio entrance. We went for our dinner and as we were walking back, not thinking of these men that we'd previously encountered, we heard them calling over, and they said, just join us for a drink. My friend and I kind of looked at each other, and it was only about midnight, so we decided that we would go and join them for a drink. My friend is hilarious, and we're both really assertive, so she decided to ask for two triples and a shot of expensive tequila when they asked us what we wanted to drink. They laughed and said how they liked that she knew what she wanted. The drinks came out pretty quickly, but the shots were taking a while, and one of the gentlemen had gotten up and left the table we assumed to take a call. After a few minutes, the gentleman came back to the table and sat down next to my friend, and the shots came out not long after with the waitress. Not thinking anything of this, my friend and I took her shots, and almost five minutes later, my friend looked at me and said, something's wrong, I don't feel right. My friend in general tends to overreact in some situations, so I brush it off and say, don't worry, everything's okay. The next part of the story is not coming from my own recollection. It's coming from my friend's recollection, because unfortunately, I don't remember anything from that night. My friend said that I began slurring my words and acting a lot more drunk than I should have been, given the amount that I had drank, and one of the gentlemen suggested that they give us a ride home because I wasn't looking so well, and I probably drank too much. My friend asked if they'd had a car, because in this big city, it's not common to drive around. It's more common to taxi or Uber, and they'd pointed to a Rolls Royce that had illegally tinted windows, and was running with a driver in the front, about five feet away from the patio that we were sitting on. And it had been there for about 30 minutes. My friend immediately got a weird feeling, and though she was also feeling kind of loopy and dizzy, she got us both out of there. She said she provided no explanation, and she grabbed me by the arm and started dragging me down the street in a downtown, highly populated area 
while booking an Uber. According to my friend, the entirety of the Uber ride I was sweating profusely, vomiting, I could barely walk, I couldn't speak, my eyes were rolled back, and I was completely incoherent. When asking my friend about how I got so sick, and how she didn't, she reminded me that she'd been drinking a lot the night before, and wasn't feeling that great, so she only took about a third of the shot because she wasn't able to finish the whole thing because she thought she was going to vomit. Me, on the other hand, of course. I took the entirety of the shot down and clearly got a higher dose of whatever was given. The next day, obviously, I felt like absolute garbage, but needless to say, I think my friend definitely saved us both that night, if not just me, from an unknown group of men who had unknown intentions with two young drunk girls and then drugged them in the heart of a big city. I'll preface this by saying we were 12 to 13 at the time, and my friend and I often snuck out of either of our houses during sleepovers for late night walks. This was the basis of this terrifying encounter, and it stopped us from ever sneaking out after dark again. My friend lived opposite a huge forest, so her house was the preferred choice to sneak out for us to roam around at night and we always took flashlights, food, and blankets so we could camp out for a couple of hours before going back home again. Well, on this fateful night, we inadvertently fell asleep instead of staying awake, so when my friend suddenly jolted me from sleep, it was past 3am, a lot later than we usually snuck out. We grabbed our essentials and creeped out of the back door into the cold and dark night. Frost crunched underfoot as we crossed the deserted road, and as we reached the entrance to the forest, we noticed how pitch black and completely silent it was, unnervingly so. We turned on our torches and stepped onto the uneven path into the forest, the light illuminating the trees swaying in the icy wind. We stepped on fallen sodden leaves and bark as we made an unsteady but familiar way into our favorite part of the forest. Our cold breath, the only noise to invade the deafening silence. We reached the small hut we constructed one afternoon, made entirely of sticks purely for the purposes of having some shelter for our campouts. There were times that vandals or other kids damaged our hut, but for the most part it stayed intact. But on this occasion, it was completely destroyed, like a harbinger of worse to come. We were deciding just to call it a night and come back later on that day to repair the hut when we heard it. This loud, shrieking giggle that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My friend and I jumped in shock and looked at each other like, what the fuck? We were completely freaked out. The eerie and unnatural giggle rang out again, contradicting the silence and making my body break out in goosebumps. Someone is in here, my friend whispered to me, looking utterly terrified. We have to go now. Her voice of rationale made it even more scary and unnerving to me that someone was in the forest with us at three o'clock in the morning. We just looked at each other in assent and took off running in unison. Our footsteps navigating the path as naturally as we could from muscle memory, our uneven gasps of air punctuating the giggling that seemed to be following us, getting closer and closer. Our torch's light went up and down with our fast movements, illuminating random patches of the trees and bushes as we finally saw a small sliver of light as we came to the forest entrance. Running out of the forest, we didn't stop until we reached the back door of my friend's house and almost collapsed in a breathless heap of relief to be safe. Then my friend's eyes went wide and she nudged me, pointing a shaky finger across the road. A haggard woman of indeterminate age was standing at the forest entrance, giggling that awful horrifying giggle and was waving over at us. 
We screamed and ran inside and looked out of my friend's bedroom window through the smallest gap in the curtain, and we could still see the woman standing there. Worse yet, she was staring right at us, as if she knew we were there. We could tell she was still giggling that hideous, appalling laugh. She turned very slowly and walked back into the forest again. We never went back to that forest, nor went out after dark again. This happened to me when I was a teenager. I think it was the spring of 1998 when I was 14. My Boy Scout troop went hiking in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. I grew up in a very small town in Tennessee, and the boys in my troop were people I'd known my whole life, and we were all very close and knew each other very well, and trusted each other. We'd been hiking for five days or so, and it was miserable. It rained every day, and we were all exhausted and sore and hungry and covered with blisters. The adults realized we'd bitten off more than we could chew in trying to hike a 60-mile trail, especially with the awful weather. So we changed course and gotten off the trail to spend a night in a drive-in campground. It was in a very remote area, far from a town or house. There may have been a few other small groups there, but if there were, we never interacted with them or saw any of them. We were all filthy and wet, and thus very excited about taking a hot shower. It was dark, and we'd finished dinner. A group of five of my friends, including my friend Jeremy, headed up to the bathhouse, which was maybe a quarter-mile walk through the pitch-dark woods up a worn-down gravel walking trail. I stayed behind to clean up, and after ten or fifteen minutes, followed them by myself. I had a weak little flashlight. I remember the woods were totally silent. When I got about halfway to the bathhouse, I heard a noise to my left, and I looked over and saw my friend Jeremy standing by an old school manual water pump about 20 feet off of the trail. There was a strange light around him, like the moon had come out from behind the clouds. I was startled to see him there by himself in the woods off the trail. I asked him if he was already done with his shower. He seemed kind of sad and he said, Yeah, it's all yours. And I said okay and didn't think much of it until I got to the bathhouse. When I walked in through the door, my friends were all in there and I heard Jeremy talking from in the shower. All the blood drained out of my head and all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had to sit down before I passed out. My friends were freaked out and wanted to know what was wrong. I told them what had happened. They nervously made jokes about how I must have been smoking pot, but I could tell they believed me. Like I said, we'd known each other forever and knew when one of us was exaggerating or playing a joke. We all waited together until everyone finished showering and brushing teeth and whatnot, and then walked back together in total silence. When we got to the spot I'd seen, whoever, he was gone without a trace. The water pump was there though. No one had noticed it before because it was a ways off the trail and obviously not in use. We got back to our campsite and went to bed freaked out. I remember not sleeping much that night. In all the years since then, I've never been able to figure out what happened. Was there a random teenage boy in the woods who looked just like my friend? Unlikely. Did I hallucinate it? Also unlikely. Who's to say? My friend from college told me a harrowing story that happened to her and her friends in high school. She's from Buffalo, New York, and often went on camping trips to local upstate campgrounds. When she was a senior, her and four of her friends went to a campsite fitted with rows of cabins on the water that people could rent. As the sun went down, 
The girls noticed that their neighbors a few cabins down were playing music and grooving around the campfire drinking beers. One of the guys asked them all if they wanted to join. When they got over there and started hanging with the guys, everything seemed completely normal and they were having a fun time. As the night progressed, one of the guys started to get blackout drunk and eventually pulled out a revolver that he said belonged to his dad. He started waving it around and playing with it. This obviously freaked everyone out, his own friends included. Eventually, he started pointing the gun to his head and laughing while his friends were yelling at him to put it away and how that wasn't funny. The girls at this point were fairly disturbed and told the guys that they should get back to their cabin and said their goodbyes. When they got back to the cabin, they all talked about how freaky that was and expressed concern for the drunk guy. They then moved on to other topics of conversation and forgot about it for the time being. A few hours later, sometime in the middle of the night, they heard a loud bang coming from the direction of their neighbor's cabin. Shortly after this, a brigade of cop cars showed up to the scene. An officer went to my friend's cabin and started asking them questions about the cabin they visited earlier that night. When my friend asked the officer what happened, he explained that the kid had shot himself in the head in front of his friends. They weren't able to discern if he'd done it purposely or it was an accident. My friend to this day still has PTSD over this incident and explained that she rarely goes camping anymore. My parents got divorced when I was 12, and my mum moved us into a small town in the Pennsylvania mountains. After a few months of living there, I went back to live with my dad in Texas. Ever since then, though, I have heard these voices of people I know calling me into the woods. It's been almost eight years now. It's only when I'm alone, but not every time I'm alone, and it seems to only happen in Texas. It's weird, but I never even considered this was maybe something to be concerned about until recently. It was just something that happened. I even followed the voice once and only thought it was kind of weird that I had heard my dad screaming for me if he didn't actually call me because I got home later and asked him about it. I don't know if this is related or not, but remembering it is what sparked this post. A few years ago, I was about a mile out in the woods in Pennsylvania when I zoned out for a minute. When I zoned back in, I heard a stick snap and looked over to see a white tail doe staring at me from about 10-ish feet away. It looked almost as if it had been trying to sneak closer to me when I looked at it. I just sort of backed away from it and went back down the mountain. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this now that I'm looking back on all the times. I just sort of brushed it off as normal. This was about four or five-ish years ago. Back then I lived with my mother in a shed on a farm surrounded by woodland. Our farmland was part of a larger piece of farmland that was split up and sold off. So we did have neighbors although they were roughly half a kilometer away each. We loved that because of the privacy. It wasn't like there was nobody nearby I couldn't go to if I needed help. That thought is what had me fearlessly walking alone at night between the hours of 7 to 8 p.m., sometimes fluctuating from earlier to later depending on the day. Sometimes I even went out on a walk at 2 a.m. in the morning because I was restless and couldn't sleep. Looking back, this was incredibly stupid, and after this incident, I never walked after 6pm ever again, always making sure there was at least some sunlight when I set out. The route I always took was a road circuit. The first part was out in the open in front of all the other farms, including my own. If anything had happened, at least one person would have noticed, and reception was pretty good, so I would also have been able to call someone. 
The second half, on the other hand, was concealed by about 200 meters of woods between the farms and the back road, stretching the full two kilometers at the back of the farm, and it was during that part of the walk when I had this creepy encounter. It was late at night, I can't remember what time exactly, but it was pitch black with the exception of my torchlight. I was about to approach the turn in the loop that would bring me out into the open again when I heard it. Hell. It was this monotone voice that repeatedly asked for help. It didn't seem panicked in the least. I took my earphones out and turned my music off to make sure I was hearing correctly, but it didn't stop. Help. Help. A very stupid part of me almost responded, because for some reason my first instinct was, Oh no, someone's in trouble. Like a naive kid, even though I would have been like 16 or 17 at the time, of course then my brain kicked in, and I realized that approaching that voice was just about the stupidest thing I could do, so I started quietly backing away. Unfortunately, my cat had followed me on the walk and wasn't backing away with me. No, she was walking towards the voice, softly hissing. I remember desperately trying to get her to come back towards me without alerting the voice to my presence, just in case they hadn't noticed me yet. But I was getting scared and didn't want to stay there a moment more, so I ran towards my cat and grabbed her. I then turned around and bolted back towards my house. I don't know if it was stupid of me to turn my back to the voice as I was making so much noise while running that there was no way they didn't know I was there and I had no way of knowing if they were giving chase. I was so fucking terrified the whole time. The image of someone cloaked in the shadows chasing me entered my mind, and even though I couldn't hear anyone behind me, I never once slowed down until I was back safe and sound within my house. It doesn't end there, though. Despite how terrifying it was, there was still a part of me that was concerned about whoever it was, because what if they really had needed help? So I asked my mother to drive us to the location. Another very stupid decision considering what we found. That being nothing. We called out and called out, but nobody answered. We didn't get out of the car though. Luckily, neither of us were that stupid. We drove home having seen nothing and no one but it still bothered me in the morning, so I had my mother drive us over again and we searched the immediate area. Nothing. No indication that anyone had been there. There was no body, which admittedly was a drastic thing to search for, but I know shock can leave you eerily calm, which could have explained the monotone voice and lack of response afterwards. It made me fear that we'd been too late and that we'd find a body in the morning. I don't know if I would have preferred this outcome, because at least I would have had a face to the voice. But no, we found absolutely nothing, and to this day, I have no idea who that voice belonged to and why they were monotonously calling out for help. My mind has naturally come to some chilling conclusions and theories that leave me unable to sleep at night. Maybe a kidnapper, serial killer all the classic horror stories, but I guess I'll never really know for sure. Okay, so this happened when I was 17. My now fiancé and I lived in the mountains and used to smoke up green often at this point. We decided to go up our favorite parkway to smoke a bit. The parkway was a long road up a mountain, with more pull-offs to look either at more mountains or down at the city. We went to our favorite pull-off, which is about 25 minutes up the mountain. We smoked and hung out for a while. Unfortunately, we didn't realize how fast it was getting dark, and the cold front was moving in. At that moment in time... I felt confident that I was sober enough to be able to drive without a problem, so we started heading our way down. Long story short, I found out real fast that I was overconfident and was still too high for this drive, 
so I asked my fiancé if I could stop at a pull-off and sober up a bit more, which he was perfectly fine with. So this is where the story starts. I pull off at the next one I see, and a car is already parked. We park about 15 feet away, and it happens so fast, I couldn't even get a full breath in. My fiancé says, What are they doing? And when I look over, the guy in the car looks like he's on top of someone. My fiancé said there was a girl in the car as well that I didn't see. The guy was in the passenger seat. What was really weird is that it honestly looked like he was choking the girl, but we couldn't tell. I mean, no judgement. Maybe it was something they were into, but our high minds were like, fuck that. I told my fiancé I was going to start driving, but it was going to be slow, so just bear with me. Again, unfortunately life always has other fucking plans. The pull-off we went into had one exactly across on the other side of the road, where we didn't see a black truck sitting there. Well, right when I was about to pull out, the truck was weirdly already waiting to pull out with his headlights off. And right when I pull out onto the road, he turns his lights on and is immediately on my bumper. At this point, I'm high as fuck freaking out, trying to just get down the mountain. Anyways, he followed me all the way down, not even backing up a bit. I get onto the highway and this truck is pulling in front of us, trying to get us to slow down, and the person keeps flickering their turn signals back and forth to get me to pull over. That happened for about two minutes before my fiancé says, slow down to 10 miles per hour, which is dangerous on a road like that. He had his own reason why he thought it was a good idea, I just don't remember. But once I did, the truck quickly sped away really fast. It didn't make any sense, and we now think there's a chance people could have been messing with us. I have no idea if us seeing a guy choking someone and then being followed were related, but it was weird. I definitely don't smoke and drive anymore. So this is a story my dad recently told me about my grandpa and his father. My grandpa grew up in very rural southern Indiana, but moved to very rural southern Illinois in his youth. So this takes place in Illinois. One night, my grandpa and his dad were hanging out at his uncle's who lived a couple of miles away. Keep in mind, this is the 40s out in the country, so all roads are just dirt basically. Anyway. It was pretty late, so they decided to head home, and they hopped into one of their old cars. They were going about 15 miles per hour through the wooded roads. At some point, as they're just driving and talking, they pass something along the edge of the road, standing upright. They both hunted, and were very familiar with any animals or other local people that may be around. Neither one of them really said anything for a minute, and they both looked at each other and said, what the hell was that? My grandpa asked his dad, Do you want to turn around? And his dad said, No. And they kept on driving. My grandpa said it resembled a big owl or small person just standing in the ditch. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on a camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped into my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot and head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon a nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point, but set up the tent to the southernmost edge of the clearing, next to the tree line and manage to get a fire going. I roast some weenies and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounds like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg 
as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I feel bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away, and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that, and go about eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent, and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep, so I pull out a book I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing towards my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it sounds like the hooves are being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops, and I hear nothing, no breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then woman's laughter and sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions, all different, i.e. men, old women, even children, and confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off in the air, in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge already, but then I noticed the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line, saw nothing, listened intensely to my surroundings, no laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that scared whoever off, I sat down and in my exhausted state I fell asleep. I wake up in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Alert, grab my rifle and listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly, a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the entire way. Never heard anyone follow me, never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night. I feel I should preface this story with a statement that I'm usually a skeptic when it comes to paranormal stories, albeit an open-minded one. I'd never had an experience I would truly say was paranormal until this one. I've searched for hours on Google, attempting to find a similar story from someone else, and have had no luck. What really stands out for me is that there's an energy or feeling that accompanies the experience, and even remembering it still gives me this feeling and goosebumps. 
This is not something I normally experience, and most people that know me would probably be surprised that I would be spooked by much of anything. I am a veteran, and I've spent years since leaving the military working in emergency rooms, specialized security, and doing other high adrenaline jobs, and I am not prone to being creeped out. I'm hoping to find someone else who may have had a similar experience, as I feel oddly compelled to relate to someone about this. With that, here goes. A couple of months ago, I was driving with my wife down a rural highway in Oregon, returning home from a road trip to Crater Lake. We live on the coast, and the highway we were taking to get back is very curvy as it winds through the Cascade Mountain Range. It was dark as ink and probably about 11 p.m. We were driving along, and I was just watching the road going about 45 miles per hour. We round a bend which makes me slow down to about 45, and just as we get around it, my wife suddenly says, Look out, there's a person there. It takes me a second for some reason as I let off the gas. Then I notice it, crouched near the side of this two-lane highway on my left side, is a person wearing what looks like grey baggy sweats or clothes and a reflective vest. This is an easy 20 miles either direction for civilization and is heavily wooded. Think Oregon Coast Forest. I begin braking, and instantly the figure stands up, faces us, and begins jogging directly to the car. It felt like electricity in the air as when she faced us. Her head was flopped to the side, like her neck was totally limp, and her mouth was wide open. She appeared to have gray hair, and her arms and hands were held up to her chest. Her wrists curled. Her legs didn't seem to be working right either as she hobbled at us. Think like severe progressed MS. Then it hit. This primal-like feeling of dread. Like my subconscious knew something wasn't right. I couldn't fully focus on her as the car was still moving and I had to steer. But my wife was looking right at her. My first thought normally would have been to hit the brakes and see what was going on, as once again this is literally miles and miles from town. But there was just this dread feeling in the air, and time almost seemed to slow down. At that moment, I hear my wife say, Don't stop, just go. Instinctively, I accelerated. As we sped up, this lady was jogging right at us and must have come within a foot of running into the side of our car as we went past her. We rounded the next bend, and I looked at my wife and just said, What the hell was that? I should turn around. Who the hell jogs out here? What was wrong with her neck? My wife just looks at me and says, No, don't go back. I don't know what that was. I told her I couldn't look directly at her for long as I was focused on the road, but I described what I saw, and she confirmed she saw the same. She said when she came up to the side of the car, she was staring right at us, and my wife looked into her eyes. But she didn't have any pupils, and her expression was frozen with her mouth open. We scoured news stories, and I even contacted authorities. They advised no one was reported missing or heard out there. I still get this strange, intense, electrified feeling any time I think about her, as does my wife. Any time I talk about her, I'm compelled to refer to the person as it. All I know is it wasn't right. We have now coined her the floppy-headed jogger. Has anyone else experienced something like this? A few years ago, I was a university student in eastern Washington, but dating a girl in western Washington. I was visiting her for the weekend during the summer when we got into a huge fight at around midnight, and I left, deciding to head back to my apartment. I mention this for context as to why I was driving through Snoqualmie Pass after one in the morning. I'd never gone through this pass so late before, 
and what is usually a very busy stretch of freeway on I-90 was completely empty. I went well over an hour without seeing a single vehicle going either way, so naturally I was driving way too fast. At the time I had a 73 Chevy Nova, it wasn't quite the classic, but it had power and a complete lack of AC. Even though it was late at night, the combination of a warm summer night and the large amount of heat that bleeds through from the engine meant that I had my windows down and was sweating. Not far into the east side of the mountains, around 1.30, I hit a long stretch of straight road that doesn't have an on-ramp or any way to get into the freeway, when suddenly a set of headlights appeared behind me, something like 200 feet back. I glanced back at the lights, puzzled as to where the vehicle could have possibly come from. I noticed that, despite the fact that I was absolutely hauling, the lights were gaining on me. I decided to switch lanes and slow down a bit so it could pass. After a moment, the vehicle, now only half that distance, moved over behind me into the same lane. This is when I began to panic. I'm in the middle of nowhere, hadn't seen another vehicle in over an hour, and now I've got some aggressive drunk running up on me. I watched as those lights got closer, 60 feet, 50 feet. 40 feet. In seconds, it was upon me. I braced against the steering wheel, expecting to get rear-ended by a vehicle going much faster than me now. I watched in my rearview mirror in horror as those headlights blasted right into the back of my vehicle, and suddenly everything froze, quite literally. Nothing physical hit me, but the whole vehicle frosted over and I could see my breath. I hit the brakes and did my best to pull over, despite not being able to see through the windshield. Every hair on my body was standing on end. I got out of my vehicle and paced back and forth, examining my car which was already starting to defrost as streams of water poured down it. There was no damage to my back bumper and absolutely no sign of whatever vehicle had hit me. Eventually I calmed down enough to get back in the car and drive the rest of the way back, wake my roommates, and explain what had just happened. The next time I drove through that area in the daylight, right about where I think the ghost car had hit me, there was a very old wooden cross, somewhat overgrown, on the side of the road. I hope this isn't too vague a question. A couple of years ago, I did a bicycle tour from Eugene, Oregon to Lagunitas, California, just north of San Francisco. To save money, I typically would drag my rig into the woods of a nearby national forest and do dispersed camping for free. I was on a shoestring budget, to say the least. If you know the basic geography of that part of Oregon, you know I had to bike west from Eugene through the coastal range and meet the Pacific coast, which I would then follow to my final destination. However, once I reached the coast, in order to keep finding free camping, I would eventually have to venture inland into the woods most nights, sometimes as far as 15 miles. Now, I've spent a significant amount of times outdoors in remote areas out west and in the upper Midwest, where I was raised. I'm familiar with the sometimes eerie silence the woods can take on when you're truly in the middle of nowhere, or the heightened vigilance that setting brings on. However, I had never before felt an oppressive, dark, dreadful energy in my environment like I did alone in the woods of Southwest Oregon. The feeling of wrongness was a common occurrence when I stopped somewhere to evaluate a campsite. I often felt a strong sense of claustrophobia in those woods, and often felt that I was not alone. A strong sense of paranoia became a nightly feature on that leg of the trip, and my sleep schedule suffered considerably. Keep in mind, I was stone cold sober on this tour. Somehow, I powered on, and I never saw any sort of creature or entity. 
but I still can't shake the feeling that there's something evil in those forests. Once again, I emphasize that I'm well-traveled in the U.S., experienced in the outdoors, and have never once felt that way anywhere else I have been. Years ago, I moved from a very small town to a remote valley out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by national forest and not many neighbors. It was just what I had always wanted. At that point in my life, I'd been a paramedic for about four or five years, and, being an outdoorsy, civic-minded sort, I decided to volunteer my services with a local search and rescue organization. For being such a tiny, poorly funded organization, we were surprisingly busy. In the nine years I was with them, we'd have at least one rescue every weekend, spring through fall. The source of the majority of these calls was the roughly 100 miles of poorly maintained fire trails that were very popular with dirt bike and quad riders. When they'd inevitably get lost or wreck and get injured, we'd head out, track them down, provide medical care, and fly them out on a helicopter or put them on a Stokes basket mounted to a janky-ass trailer thing we'd pull with the quad. About two weeks after joining, and zero training beyond what I'd learned as a Boy Scout and medic, I got my first call. A group of dirt bikers from the city had lost a member of their party. For some reason, they'd put their least experienced rider at the back of the group of a dozen or so riders and took off into the woods. When they returned to the trailhead, Four hours later, the inexperienced guy was missing. They set out again and looked for him for four or five hours, then they gave up and called 911. The time interval from the initial 911 call until we had a squad assembled at the trailhead was pretty impressive, no more than 20 minutes, but we were already eight or nine hours behind the ball. We did a very quick briefing, distributed maps, divided into teams then set off. They put me on a squad with the most experienced guy, and we headed out. The plan was, for each two to three person team, to take one of the longer trails that ring the place, then after searching those, we'd systematically work our way into the shorter, maze-like trails that made up the interior. This was to be a hasty search, none of that grid search shit, just riding around looking for clues. I don't know what I had expected exactly. Maybe a few dirt roads through the woods or something, but these trails were an absolute nightmare. They were extremely rugged, technical trails, where you really had to know what the fuck you were doing and where you were going, or you'd never make it out. GPS rarely worked due to the rugged terrain and tree cover. Radios and cell phones were a shit shoot and the maps didn't account for all the random trails riders would just sort of make. The only marked roads were fire breaks, and mileage-wise, those accounted for maybe 10% of the trails. Why this guy hadn't been partnered with someone or put in the front of the group is a mystery. Four hours into this, I'm caked with mud, bleeding from being hit with branches, exhausted and just fucking done. We take a water break, and hear broken radio traffic that sounds like a bike has been found, but no rider. It's only a couple of miles from us, so we head that direction. When we get there, the bike is off to the side of the road, along with the quads of the other teams, but we can see them a few hundred feet in the woods. We walk over and find them looking down at the missing person, who is very dead, lips blue, skin dusky, arms spread out like a cross. On first glance, his eyes looked to be wide open and solid white, but when I examined him, I could see that his eyes were actually covered with fly eggs. The guy had been dead for a while. It didn't make much sense though. His bike still had gas in it. He had water and food, and he was a healthy guy in his late twenties. Why was he dead? It looked like he'd simply laid his bike down, then ran into the woods to die. Mission accomplished, I guess. 
We wrapped him in blankets, then put him on the stokes and took him to the trailhead where a coroner was waiting. About a week later, I ran into the coroner and asked what the cause of death had been. The pathologist's determination was cardiac dysthymia second to extreme anxiety. The guy literally died of fright, which up until that point, I had always assumed was Hollywood bullshit. I've always wondered what was going through his head. Was he just afraid of the woods or being lost? If so, why did he run blindly into the woods instead of continuing to follow the trail? There's a part of me that thinks he may have seen something out there. I've heard a lot of stories about weird shit in these woods, and I've seen a few strange things myself, so it wouldn't surprise me. When I was about 9 or 10, I was invited to a classmate's birthday party at some swimming baths. All of us were the same age. It was a small class of about 20 kids, and I'm pretty sure everyone was invited. Just to clarify, I'm male. Anyway, I kinda got separated from everyone, and it was just me and this girl alone. I wasn't particularly close friends with her, but I did know her as she was in my class. To describe the location we were in, it was in a tunnel that connected the main wave pool to a lazy river. There wasn't really anybody else there. It was just me and her when she suddenly lunged at me without warning. She grabbed my head and held it underwater. I was a pretty skinny kid, and she was bigger than me and a bit of a tomboy. About 20 seconds went by as I furiously tried to free myself, but she wasn't letting go. Fight or flight and mass panic took over, and I eventually fought my way free. I was coughing and spluttering water as I emerged. I remember looking at her and just being in shock. I think I began to ask why she did that when she lunged at me again. She again held my head underwater for what felt like a lifetime before I fought my way free. Both times, I genuinely thought I was going to drown, and she never let me up. I had to fight my way free. I couldn't swim at the time, but the water in the lazy river and tunnel was just maybe chest high. I began to backpedal away from her. She was giggling as if it was funny and had this kind of crazed look and grin on her face. I couldn't just climb out to escape as it was a tunnel, so I had to try and get out of there. As I was backpedaling, she was following me and I made sure to keep distance so she couldn't lunge at me again but she was gaining on me. I actually managed to reason with her as I was so scared of her I was babbling at her. I tried to distract her by suggesting we go down the water slide together. It worked as I could see her thinking about it and she stopped chasing me. I managed to exit the tunnel and water and she slowly followed me but seemed a bit unsure. I immediately felt more safe as I was out of the water and could see other people about as we headed towards the slides. I kept talking all the way up about how fun the slides were and whatnot, but she didn't really speak at all and had a really strange look on her face the full time. Anyway, after we went down the slides, I caught up with my friends and just stuck with them the rest of the time as I was a bit shaken up. I never told them about it as it was a bit embarrassing to admit a girl had tried to drown me and I was worried I would get teased. Anyway, fast forward to adulthood. This girl is now in a relationship with another woman. Her partner had two or three kids from a previous relationship with the guy. It turns out they would torture the kids and eventually killed one of them. She's currently serving a life sentence in prison. I told my friends about the swimming pool incident after hearing about her crimes, and I'm pretty sure they think I'm just bullshitting, as none of them took me seriously. Maybe as I kind of lightheartedly said I was almost victim number one. However, nonetheless, it's a bit crazy to think back, as she obviously was a genuine psychopath, and if I'd never fought her off me to escape, and then convinced her to go down that slide, I genuinely believe she could have killed me.
I have lived in New York City all of my life, but this ranks as one of my oddest encounters. I probably owe my life to someone I met only briefly. It was about 30 years ago, and I was coming out of my dentist who was located on a desolate side street between Penn Station and 7th Avenue, not far from Macy's Herald Square. At about 6.30 p.m., my dental work finished and the sun just started to set. I walked out of the appointment only to run into a man who repeatedly, intentionally body slammed me while pretending it was an accident. I had formed an intention to say nothing, but to slowly edge my way closer and closer to the open door of a chock full of nuts and make a quick dash for the entrance. Again and again the man said, Excuse me, miss and slammed into me from the street side as I tried to pick my way across the sidewalk to the open door. He must have stepped back and hit me six or eight times when out of nowhere a large man stepped forward and said, Miss, where are you going? Terrified that they were a tag team, I said, I'm trying to make my way to the 6th Avenue subway entrance at Macy's. This mysterious guy grabbed me and propelled me so quickly the couple of blocks to the subway that my feet didn't touch the ground, even though I was a young woman of large size and a former distance runner who could move with great speed. The mystery man took me right to the train, then disappeared. My dad said he was probably a plainclothes cop. I'll never know who he was or what the other guy was trying to pull but I will always be grateful for having been saved from something quite potentially bad. I used to work night shift at a gas station in Florida straight out of high school. It was a great job. It was so slow that the other cashier and I would hang out front and smoke cigarettes if we didn't have customers, and sometimes a friend or two would drop by. Well, one night we were doing just that, and we see a truck coming up the road being pushed by four guys, and followed closely by a police car and another car. The truck is clearly out of gas, and having worked there for a while, this is more common than people think. We figure the police car is slowly riding behind them so that another car doesn't slam into them. This is a normal procedure for police in my city. Well, the exact moment the truck is pushed up to a pump, a whole swarm of police cars fly into the only entrance of the gas station, completely blocking it off. All of the cops are now aiming their AR-15s and Glocks at the guys who pushed the truck, yelling at them to get on the ground and not move. One of the guys started reaching in the truck, and I thought he was about to get blown away. I should mention that the angle of the attack put us in line of fire. After they arrest two of the guys, we find out they'd robbed another gas station up the street. Apparently, the truck's description didn't match, but they got the license plate right, and when the cop pulled behind the truck to make sure they didn't get hit, he ran the plates and called for backup. I used to love that job. For as long as I can remember, I've seen shadows and heard creaking, closing doors, misplaced items, and other unexplainable things throughout my childhood home. I've always watched horror movies and scared myself by reading creepypastas, which means I had several different escape routes planned out, depending on where the serial killer that was obviously going to come for me tried to get in. One day when I was in high school, I was home alone after school, sitting in the living room watching TV. From the mudroom that connects the living room to the garage, I heard a loud bang like someone smashing their fist against the door connecting the garage and the mudroom. I ran up to the kitchen with my phone, grabbed a knife, and peeked over the counter out the window towards the front of the house. No one is outside, there were no cars, and the garage door was still closed, meaning no one got into the garage, and no wind slammed the door. I eventually talked myself out of the whole serial killer thing, but I haven't been able to explain it, and it hasn't happened again. A different night, my parents were gone when I went to sleep. I wake up to knocking on my bedroom door, 
my parents wouldn't have knocked to check in on me sleeping. Without access to a weapon, I froze, because obviously this time it's going to be the serial killer. I just laid there for ten minutes. I never heard any footsteps, nothing. I got up and went to my parents' room. They were both fast asleep, so it's not even like they just come home when I heard the knocking. On a different day, I set a water bottle on the kitchen counter and kept walking towards the hallway. A couple of seconds later, I hear the bottle fall, but when I get back into the kitchen, the bottle is across the room. And yet another day, I was home alone in the living room when I heard a sneeze from the back towards the bedrooms. My first instinct was to say, bless you. My second thought was, didn't my boyfriend leave 30 minutes ago? And during college, I came home for a break. I had to sleep in the loft bed. I brought my sister's dog up with me because she liked to cuddle. I was woken up by the feeling and sound of someone climbing up the ladder, which I was very acquainted with at the time. I could feel my sister's dog against my leg laying between me and the edge. When I felt something pet down the blanket like they were petting the dog, I must have moved because the dog realized I was awake and immediately turned around to jump onto my chest with her ears down, shaking. The intensity of the events is toned down quite a bit, but for a stretch of time, something wanted to make itself known. So this happened when I was 14 or 15 and often stayed over at my cousin's and her husband's house. We'll call them Skylar and Josh, female 24, male 26 at the time. I had been staying at their house for a week straight prior to the incident with no issues. It was during the summertime in a neighborhood that was pretty rapidly expanding. You know those monochrome suburban nightmare cul-de-sacs. There are tons of those half-finished houses lining the far end of the neighborhood. I feel this info is pretty important. Anyways, Josh and I were avid movie watchers and stayed up most nights watching whatever looked good. That night, Skylar went to bed early and we stayed up to watch Would You Rather and then Ridiculous 6. Movie sucks by the way. Semi-important context. Josh is a smoker and goes out to the back patio for a cigarette every so often especially at night when he takes their beagle, Banjo, out to pee. I ended up sleeping through the movie on one of their two couches. The couch is backed against the wall and to the left of it is a window into the backyard. It was the only window in the living room. At some point, I keep hearing Banjo whomping and hollering in the playroom, then again in the kitchen, then the playroom, and so on and so forth. The dog is going apeshit in literally every room on the first floor, but he is a clingy dog that hated when Skylar and Josh shut him out of the room, so I figured he was just whining. He's also a beagle, so we're used to him being vocal. In hindsight, I probably should have wondered why he was running from room to room. Whatever. I tried to sleep through it. After a good while of Banjo flipping his shit in what I think is a kitchen, he kinda goes quiet. But he wakes me up again growling at the window right next to the couch I'm sleeping on. He would not be still. I still didn't get up. I fell back asleep for a bit. Then out of nowhere, he jumps on the couch right next to my stomach and starts losing his shit barking and howling. That wasn't what woke me up though. It was a light shining from the outside of the window right in my face. I wasn't scared at first, more confused than anything, since my eyes hadn't adjusted at that point. Then the flashlight shines up right on the man's face and he looks identical to Josh. Could have been twins. He's crouched down with his face almost right against the glass and when I see him, I jump really hard. I don't remember if I screamed but the man started laughing at me. I can hear from the other side of the window. However, because I'm big stupid, I assume Josh is on a smoke break just trying to spook me. I start walking upstairs and as I passed their kitchen clock, it was like 4am. I didn't even put two and two together that Josh had no reason to be outside or awake at this hour. I'm so groggy but also unnerved at this point, 
so I go to sleep on the upstairs hallway floor. I didn't go alert Skylar of what just happened, mostly because she's a cranky bitch when you wake her up, and I was still more willing to accept the idea that it was Josh being an idiot on a smoke break rather than some maniac scoping the house. The next afternoon, I bring it up to them, and they sort of write it off, ask me if I'm sure that I wasn't dreaming, etc. But they did say they heard the dog going wild. I check outside where the window is to see if the man dropped any evidence of him being there, and I kind of want to vomit. The tall grass around the house was pressed down like someone was on their knees. I don't even want to know how long this man was sitting there on the grass to have it pressed down still, but I have a feeling that it was pretty long. Banjo sat by the window for a hot minute, and the flashlight thing was the only thing that woke me up. I'm glad I saw the grass though, because it felt so much like a fever dream. Sometimes I still wonder if it happened, but I know it did. My theory is some squatter in one of the unfinished houses was either bored or on something, and decided to go on an adventure. But yeah, I would have absolutely gotten my shit rocked in a horror movie at that age. A bit of context. I'm a 22-year-old female. I'm petite, really pale, and always with messy hair. I was wearing loose clothes, all white. I was outside smoking while sitting on a chair in my front yard. I forgot to mention an essential detail. I live in the countryside. My street leads to fields and forests. The night here hits differently, if you know what I mean. This guy offers some great masterpieces freely to our starry eyes. So yes, I was just hyper-focusing on the sky. I just stood up and decided to take a picture. I wanted to reproduce it through painting. However, I was really disappointed by my lame camera, so I decided to head inside to grab one of my parents' phones since their quality was better. While I was trying to take some pictures, I felt a gaze on me. It was my new neighbor. She was staring right at me. I was in my front garden just in front of her house. I was waiting since in my front yard there's an automatic light. It flashes at any movement and lasts for like 20 seconds, so I was only visible for a moment. It was pitch dark again. There are no street lights where I live, so I was relieved to feel invisible. As I was finally taking mesmerized pictures, out of the blue, the flash of the phone I was holding started to light up. The moon was right on the left side of her house, so yeah, it looked like I was taking photos of her house. I heard her screaming. I put my hand on the flashlight and turned it off. I was petrified. I didn't know which option was the best. A. Fleeing right away into my house, so I had to reactivate the flash, looking suspicious. B. Confront her and explain the whole situation, because I scared her quite often. Or C. Just disappearing in the dark and waiting. Okay. So I'm a night owl and I love art. It's not unusual to see me outside standing right in front of my house or in the middle of the driveway past midnight taking pictures, smoking, or just contemplating. So I spooked her multiple times. I know because she said that I was the weird neighbor to someone. One day I was playing in the front yard, playing with my cat with a red laser pointer, obviously late at night. I accidentally pointed my laser to one of her windows, so a bright red dot was visible. I heard her screaming, turn the light on in the room. I turned off the laser and I glanced at her. She looked at me and shut the curtains. Back to the story. The option I decided to choose was to not move and wait. Then I was like, I guess I should still continue taking pictures. I heard loud voices, the front door opened. I heard them walking slowly towards their car and whispering. What was I supposed to do? I took one last picture and headed to my house. As the flash went on, I was petting my cat. I heard her again saying, Again, this weird chick. As soon as I closed the door, I laughed out loud. I guess it was a nervous reaction. Maybe I should find a way to talk to her. 
reassure her that I'm inoffensive, or I guess I could just remain the weird neighbor. When I was 15, I had a crush on this girl from a different city who unfortunately had their house burned down by a meth addict neighbor. She called me immediately to let me know what happened and I told her I will go as soon as I can. I really meant it because after I got off the phone, I changed clothes and sneaked out of the house. I think it was already 3 or 4 a.m. and I had no means of getting to the bus stop unless I walk. The bus stop was pretty far from where I live, so I was switching between running and walking. If I get tired, I'll sit down for a couple of minutes at the old cold pavement before walking and running again. While resting under one of the light posts at the other side of the road, I saw someone riding a motorcycle at a very slow pace. I can also hear music from the motorcycle. I guess they saw me sitting because they turned and drove towards my direction. I did not think it was strange. I kept sitting there until the motorcycle stopped in front of me. On the motorcycle was a guy who appeared to be in his thirties, skinny, bald and pale. Tied to his neck is a rope attached to a small radio player. It was playing music, but at a very low volume. Where are you going? He asked. Me, having absolutely no sense of stranger danger, told him I'm going to the bus stop. He said, you won't catch the bus if you just walk. I noticed this guy is very giggly. It's like every time he talks, he finds it funny or silly. I told him it was okay and I can walk very fast. But it's dark, he told me. If you want, I can give you a ride. He says this with a very white smile. Since I'm very stupid and I just want to go to my friend as soon as I can, with a sparkle in my eye, I said, Sure. I hopped on the motorcycle and we began cruising the streets. While riding, I noticed he makes sudden short breaks that cause me to move closer to his back. When I pull myself away, he would do these stops again. A couple of minutes on the ride, I realized he went the wrong way. I told him he missed the correct turn but he was not responding. He increased the volume of the radio and drove faster instead. That's when I thought this guy would do something terrible to me. I'd rather break my kneecaps than be killed by this guy. I jumped off the moving motorcycle like Evil Knievel. I landed on my feet but lost balance and fell on my ass. I couldn't stand because my knees were shaking and I had gashes on my palms. The guy shouted, You motherfucker! as his motorcycle wiggles, almost crashing. I thought to myself, if this guy turns around, I'm absolutely going to die today. Thankfully, he kept on. Even limping, I managed to walk towards the bus stop. I went and visited the girl to make sure she was okay. I also had my first kiss that day. My name is Rick Martinez and I'm a retired truck driver. This happened when I was like 30 years old. I'm now 62. On the road, I see many strange things. I've told this story over and over. A lot of people don't believe me, but it starts off in Stockton, California, where I picked up a load of pipe. My destination was Salt Lake City, Utah. I was supposed to refuel in Barstow, California at a truck stop, but lo and behold, they were out of fuel. So I told my supervisor, hey, I got like half a tank of fuel. He told me to continue and hit the first truck stop I see. So 100 miles into Nevada, I see nothing but a sparsely lit desert with a couple of towns. When I noticed my gauge set was reading empty, I think to myself, that's not right. So I took the first exit I saw and pulled over. I told my supervisor, who was right behind me an hour away, that I was afraid to continue on and run the tanks dry. So he told me to sit still and he would be by in an hour 
and we could siphon some of the fuel from his tank into mine. So I sat there, and I noticed that it was a small town with sparse lighting. As I sat there, I couldn't run the engine, so I couldn't listen to the radio. I sat there in silence. I don't do drugs, and I didn't make this up, so listen carefully. As I'm sitting there, I notice a lot of undone construction, a trailer park to my right completely dark, and a church off to my left about a block away with its lights on. It's about 2am, and I see this jackrabbit hopping around my truck. It hops around and just stares at me and keeps hopping around. So I'm getting hungry, and I notice what looks to be a convenience store another block away from the church. So I get out of the truck and decide to walk to the store. While I'm walking, I keep hearing this dog howling like it's in pain. As I'm passing the church, two of the doors are wide open, and I hear clapping like they're having a service. I look inside, and there's no one except for the skinny white old man reading from the Bible and talking about hell. I don't linger too long and continue on my way. I then hear clapping again, and that's about the time the dog starts to howl once more. I notice there's a bunch of empty houses on the street that goes uphill. I'm still making my way towards what I think is a little mini-mart. All this time, the dog keeps howling. All the lights are on, and as I go inside, this little old lady with glasses is reading a book. There's hardly anything in this store. Maybe a few cans of food, a couple of bags of chips, and only water in the refrigerators. This whole time, the lady didn't even pick her head up from the book. So I grab a water and get some chips. I'm hungry as hell and there's nothing to eat. So I ask the old lady, is this all you have? Where is everybody at? She told me everybody moved out and new construction was supposed to begin like six months ago. She didn't say anything after that, so I paid her and walked out and started walking back towards the truck. The whole time, the dog is still howling. So as I get closer towards the church, I looked up the street towards where I heard the howling from. I decided to go see for myself why the dog was howling. The houses on both sides of the street are boarded up and dark. I saw a house with the lights on, with about a five-foot fence. When I looked over the fence, I was in shock. What I saw was a man in his underwear with a chain attached to his neck on all fours, howling. The hairs on my arms and neck stood up as I saw this other man burst through the back door and kick the man on all fours and was yelling at him to shut up. The man on all fours ran into a doghouse. I was in shock and turned and ran back down the hill to my truck. As I passed the church, both doors still wide open, but there were no lights on anymore, and I could still hear the clapping. Finally, I made it to my truck and called my supervisor. I reported what I saw. I told him to hurry up and get here so I can leave. My supervisor asked what exit I was talking about, and I told him. He said, Oh, I passed that. He had to turn around and come back to get me. So I'm sitting there, and the rabbit is still hopping around my truck. It stopped and looked up at me as I was sitting in my truck. I'm not saying the rabbit said it, but this is what I heard. Leave. I rolled up the window and waited for my supervisor, who showed up about five minutes after. I told my supervisor what happened and he just laughed at me and told me that he's going to drug test me. I did not sleep on that whole trip to Utah until I got to Salt Lake City. Believe it or not, I swear this is what happened. A good lesson for kids about stranger danger. This was four years ago. I was 15 and loved puzzles. I wanted to buy one but didn't have much money, so I went out with my sister looking for some random toy stores that sold off-brand and cheap toys. We found one in an area of town that didn't have much activity around 
It didn't really look like a toy store in the front, and when you walked in, you could see the shelves were full and looked like they hadn't been rearranged in years. It kind of seemed like the store didn't really have a reason to be there. There was a man at the cash register who noticed our coming in. I didn't really get a weird vibe from him or the store. It was just empty. So we look around and there are no puzzles. So I go up to the man and ask him, Hey, I can't seem to find any puzzles. Do you know if there are any that I'm missing? The man answers, Oh, yeah, there are puzzles. They're downstairs. I didn't see any downstairs when we entered the store, but I was like, sure, show me the puzzles. This was like the third store we tried, so I just wanted to find my toy, you guys. The man walks around the corner and to this door that you wouldn't notice unless it was pointed at. He opened it and it revealed a steep staircase going down. At the bottom was a plain wall. You would have to go left or right to enter whatever the room was. It didn't seem like there were toys down there. It was also kind of dark down there too. Also, if there really was a downstairs to this door, wouldn't the door be open? At that moment, I got that stomach drop and the uh, get the fuck out of there man feeling. The man was looking at me, waiting for my sister and I to walk down in front of him. I was like, uh, I, uh, well, uh, oh. My mom is calling me, I'll be right back. My sister and I got the hell out of there, and I've never even been close to that store since. Maybe there were puzzles down there, maybe there weren't, but I was definitely not going to stay and find out. It's very important to be careful in this sort of situation, because if I was right, and the man did have bad intentions, then if I'd taken even just one step closer to the stairs, he could have pushed me down at that moment, and there would have definitely been no possible escape. So don't go down random stairs, y'all. Stay safe. Years ago, I was walking my dog with my sister at a farm right by my house. The farm owner, a nice lady who still runs it today, let the public use their farm and woods for free to walk their dogs as long as the dog stayed on their leads when by the farm animal pens and fields. The farm was quite big and if you walk further in, there's little woods at the back of it which are normally quite deserted. We always feel safe walking here though because we've both known the farm owner since we were babies and the walls surrounding the farm are massive and couldn't be easily climbed over if that makes sense. Anyway, we go into the farm and make our way to the woods because in the woods, we can let our dog off the lead. After we let him off his lead, he starts walking around. The woods go in a big circle around the farm, so we usually just do a lap of the woods before coming back into the farm and going home. We were walking along chatting and then sitting ahead of us on a fallen down tree log was a man. He was just sitting there what I mean is, he wasn't drinking coffee he had bought from the little farm shop at the farm. He didn't have a dog with him. He was just sitting on the log staring straight ahead at the trees and the woods. We carry on walking and as we come close to him, he suddenly looks over at us quite quickly and says, The only way out of this place is over there. In this monotone voice and points at the woods, which is a part of the woods that just leads to more woods and then to a brick wall that surrounded the farm. We just ignored him and carried on walking. We told the lady who owns the farm that there was a man in the woods and she said she hadn't seen anyone go in there before us, but asked us nevertheless what he was doing. We said he wasn't doing anything, just sitting there, but we did tell her what he said to us. She looked confused and went into the woods with us and asked us to show her where he had been, so we did. We showed her where he had pointed and she said, that leads to the wall that used to separate the farm and the railroad tracks. Apparently, years before there was a railway next to the farm that just stopped being used for whatever reason, some 30 years before. Now just sits there overgrown and desolate. Don't know what that man meant about that being the only way out of the woods. 
but the whole thing made me feel unnerved. We never saw him again, and neither did the farm owner. When I was 19, my best friend was diagnosed with stage 4 ovarian cancer. We knew her cancer was terminal, and she had a life expectancy of 5 years at most. Her and I would talk every now and then about passing on, and how even though I was healthy, I could always go before her in a crash or some other way. We made a pact that no matter which one of us left first, we would come back to the other and let them know that there was more to life after death. She eventually passed away from her illness at 22 years old, leaving behind her husband and her three-year-old son. She passed away on a Sunday at 8.20 a.m. I remember the call from her husband vividly. He asked me to bring her son to the hospital because she'd passed away. That day was a complete blur. I couldn't find myself to come to the reality that she was no longer with us. It all felt unreal. We were allowed to be with her for a few hours in her hospital room before she was taken away. But while we were there with her, I don't know. I was in complete shock, and my mind just couldn't process it. I didn't cry. Leaving the hospital was so strange, because at the time I had no children, and my life revolves around my work, my home, and her. She lived a few minutes from my job at the time, so I would always leave work very early to see her, whether she was at home or the hospital. I loved her so much. I could never be away from her, so now knowing I had to go home and trying to process I would never see her again just threw my life for a spin. That night I couldn't sleep, I just kept trying to make sense of it all. In all honesty, I don't even remember the thoughts that were going through my head, but the feelings of loss and confusion were very prevalent in me. I couldn't sleep at all, but at around 3 in the morning, I felt the most beautiful and reassuring feeling I've ever felt. I felt what I can only describe as a warm hug take over me from head to toe, and I fell asleep. That night I had a dream. In my dream, I called her husband to let me know that she'd written me a letter. He then tells me it's funny because she left him a voicemail. He then asks me to read him the letter, so I read it to him. In this letter, she tells us how thankful she is that we were in her life. She thanked us for taking care of her and loving her. She asks us to please watch over her son, and that she's okay and no longer in pain. She also tells us that we will be okay. As I finish telling him about the letter, my mom comes into my room and wakes me up. She asks me for a pen and paper. I hand her a piece of paper I had, and she starts to write. When she finishes, she hands it to me, saying she didn't know why, but something told her to write this and give it to me. When I read the letter, it was word for word what my best friend told me in my dream, and she signed it with her father's last name. Now, my mom only knows her by her mother's last name. No one outside her close relatives and myself knew her father's last name so I was very confused as to how she signed it with her father's last name. I asked why or how she wrote this. My mom didn't know. She just wrote. I explained to her about my dream, and she was as surprised as I was. I immediately called her husband and told him about the letter in my dream. He agreed they were all her words. My best friend came through with her promise. This made me a believer. I know there's more after death. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share you can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. 
Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdoski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Cami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B., Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keaton, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoid, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, K, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.